Hi, my job is to give you a short lecture on power counting in effective field theories. So let's just start with some generic effective theory which is valid below some scale of new physics which is typically called lambda. And write down the Lagrangian, so you have some terms of dimension 4, some terms of dimension 6, and so on. Sometimes you might have terms of dimension 5, but typically um, you go from 4 to 6. And then by dimensional analysis, there's some scale here, which is lambda squared, and then dimension 7 would have lambda cubed, etc. And so what I want to discuss is a slightly more sophisticated way of doing the power counting for an effective theory. So what I have is a Lagrangian like this with a bunch of fields. So they generate vertices which have draws generic blobs like this where the lines represent either scalar or fermion fields or gauge fields. And what I want to do is get, de derive a power counting which is self-consistent, which is to say that if I consider an effective Lagrangian with some power counting which I write down, that if I consider multiple loops or arbitrary diagrams, the amplitudes that generate still respect the same power counting. So what I want to do is write down a vertex, or a Feynman rule for a vertex, or effectively a term in the Lagrangian. So what the vertex looks like is there's an overall 2 pi to the fourth momentum conserving delta function. So imagine that there's some momentum p1, p2, etc. coming in. The sum of all the momenta add up to zero. Then for every scalar field, I'm going to say the scalar field is dimension one, so I'm going to get the effective, the effective Lagrangian term has some scalar field over f to the power a. And what's, for the fermion fields, I'm going to have f square root of lambda to the a, to the b, where b is, uh, to the b, sorry, where b is the number of fermion fields. So I'm doing a slightly more sophisticated version of the power counting where I have two scales, f and lambda, and we'll see how they're related, both have dimensions of mass. Gauge fields come in in terms of field strength tensors to the power C, you get covariant derivatives to the power D. And then, because the term has dimension 4, I'll put an overall F squared lambda squared out in front, so to make up for the dimensions. And so what I'm going to argue is that this is a self-consistent power counting, and there has to be a specific relation between F and lambda. So to see this, just construct some random diagram. And work out what you get. So let's suppose that all my vertices have this power counting. And what I mean by that is they have this structure with some coefficient in front C, which is order 1. And now let's look at what amplitude I generate for a diagram like this, where this will have some number of external phi lines, some psi lines, some field strength tensors, and covariant derivatives. So it produces a generic operator of this kind. And I'll just use A, E, B, E, et cetera, to, gener uh, to denote what amplitude I'm producing. It has A, E external phi lines, B, B, E external psi lines, and so on. So if I stick a bunch of vertices like this together, I get F squared lambda squared 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 of P one of these factors for each vertex. Then for every vertex, I get a factor of 1 over f to the number of scalar lines. But the different vertices may have different numbers of scalar lines. <coughs> Excuse me. So I get 1 over f to the sum on ai, where the ai's are the individual vertices. Similarly, I get 1 over f root lambda. Let me keep a little gap here. 1 over f root lambda to the sum on bi. Similarly, for the gauge fields, I'll get g over lambda squared to the ci. And then here, I get a 1 over lambda to the di. And I'm calculating a diagram. So there's going to be factors of momentum and so on that I'm integrating over. So the covariant derivatives end up producing factors of momentum. I'll put a p there for the typical size of a derivative. And a field strength tensor is a gauge field times a derivative. So there's some p here corresponding to each of the gauge fields. And what I want to do is construct an amplitude which is proportional to the structure and see what coefficient I get out in front. So when I finally do the diagram, I'm going to get something of this form. So the pieces left over are 
one of these factors goes into the amplitude, so I subtract a one from here to look at the effective, so basically I'm calculating a C effective, which is the new C that I get for some vertex of this kind. It has A external phi lines, so I need one factor of one over F for each external phi line, so the remaining one over Fs are AI minus AE. Similarly here, I have to subtract a BE. There I have to subtract a C external, and here I have to subtract a D external. And then I have left out one thing, which is all the internal propagators. So I get a D4K over 2 pi to the fourth, 1 over K squared for each internal scalar line. And so those are the number of internal phi lines plus the internal number gauge lines. And the fermion propagators go like 1 over K, so I get D4K over 2 pi 4 to 1 over k to the internal number of fermion lines. And now I want to do this diagram, and as we're just doing dimensional analysis, I can do it by saying that my effective theory is valid for momenta less than a fourth of this lambda. So I'm just going to cut off all the integrals at order lambda. And as a result, all the remaining momenta and so on in this calculation all get, basically get controlled by this cutoff lambda. So the net effect of the C's is the following. This factor of P, which is one of the internal momenta, becomes a lambda. All of these 1 over k squareds become lambda, so I get 1 over lambda squared to the internal phi lines plus internal gluon lines, 1 over lambda to the i sub psi. And now I'm left with these d4k's over 2 pi to the fourth, and these momentum de delta functions. And you know the net result of doing all of that is that you get a number of integrals equal to the number of loops. And for each loop, I get a factor. So let me get rid of this 2 pi to the fourth, and all of this stuff, and just put in the fact that I'm going to get an integral d4k over 2 pi 4 to the number of loops, which is lambda 4 over 16 pi squared to the number of loops. So why is the lambda 4? Because just the, the, by dimensional analysis, the d4k gives me lambda to the fourth. And the 16 pi squared is the well-known fact that every integral in four dimensions gives you a 1 over 16 pi squared. It's basically related to the fact that you get a 1 over 4 pi to the d in the dimension of regularization formula, or equivalently, if you switch to polar coordinates, for the momentum integrals, the area of a 3 sphere is 2 pi squared, and that ends up producing a net 1 over 16 pi squared for each loop. But in doing this, we need to know something about the relation between the number of loops and the vertices and the internal lines. And so I just erased a whole bunch of stuff, but we know how many independent momenta there are. Every vertex has an independent momentum for each line. The vertices also have one delta function for each vertex. So each delta function produces one momentum constraint. So you have I minus V uh, conditions independent uh, momenta. And another, and sorry, there's also the number of external lines because some of the lines in this from the delta function could have been external lines. So this is the total number of independent momenta that we have. And another way of counting the number of independent momenta is to say that there's a number of external lines for the entire graph, which is again the total number of external lines. And I have L loop momenta, but there's one overall energy momentum delta function constraint acting on all the external lines, and so I get a minus one from that. So this is just another way of counting the total number of independent momenta I have. So this is a formula for the number of loops, and one way to write this equation is to say that the vertices minus the internal lines plus loops is equal to 1. So this is a topological formula from basically from graph theory telling you that the Euler character of a graph is 1. The analogous thing for triangulations of surfaces is that vertices minus edges plus faces is the Euler character of the surface, 2 for a sphere, etc. So this is the analogous formula for graphs. And the thing which I've left out, which 
is necessary with this formula to hold and for which all of these calculations are taking place is that the graph needs to be connected. So the one is essentially the number of connected components. So now using this formula, so this is where the L comes from. This tells you how many L's we have or how many loops we have. So given this, we can now simplify our results. So because uh, I want to keep this mess here, let me just put the formula up, up top. So the vertices minus internal lines plus loops is 1. And we also have some other relations, which is called cons sometimes known as conservation of ends, which is the following. Every vertex has A in phi lines. So sigma AI is the total number of phi lines coming out of all of these vertices added up. They can either be an external phi line, or they can be an internal phi line. But if you have an internal phi line, you're using up two of these because you're using the phi line coming out of one vertex and going into the second vertex. So this is AE plus twice the number of internal phi lines. And similarly, you have the same expressions for, uh, let me just put it here, for the fermion line, sigma BI is B external plus twice I psi, and sigma CI is C external plus twice I gluon. So using that, you see that this stuff all collapses into a much simpler expression. Now, one little thing I left out here is that this momentum here it also becomes lambda. All of the momentum became lambda. So let's see how to do this. So the sum of AIs is AE plus 2I phi. The AE cancels, so I can replace this by 2I phi. Similarly here, this becomes 2i psi. On this one, I get 2ig. And this uh, remains. Now, if I take this factor here, with the fact that I want to add a 1 over lambda squared to the i phi there and collect the terms with powers of i phi, you can see that what's happening is, okay, so now we have to go down here, is I get 1 over f squared lambda squared to the i phi. From there, I get 1 over f squared lambda squared to the i psi. From here, I get g squared over, um, so here there's one factor of lambda which gets squared, and then there's two more there, so that's 1 over lambda fourth to the ig. Here, lambda over lambda is 1, so we've taken care of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 factors. I'm left with f squared lambda squared to the b minus 1. And then I'm left with lambda to the fourth over 16 pi squared to the number of loops. And I'll write that as lambda squared over 4 pi to twice the number of loops. OK, so after this long calculation, we're left with this mess down here. OK, so let me get rid of stuff I don't need. OK, so here's my formula. So let's put the C effective down here and then work backwards. So this is the typical size of the coefficient that we want. And now I want to get rid of all of these annoying factors. But you can see from here that you get an i phi and an i psi and an ig. And when you add them all up, you're going to get the number of internal lines. And I want to use this identity up here. So to be able to do that, I'm going to rewrite this term to look just like the other terms and com uh, combine them into the number of internal lines. So let's just work upward. So I get 1 over f squared lambda squared to the number of internal lines. So that's i phi plus i psi plus ig. But I don't have exactly this factor for the last term. So I'm going to write that, correct for that. 
by writing this as g squared f squared over lambda squared to the ig. And then I get f squared lambda squared to the d minus 1 lambda squared over 4 pi twice the number of loops. And now I can use this identity over here. Uh, for example, I have 1 over f squared lambda squared to the i and f squared lambda squared to the v minus 1, so I can get rid of this term and write that as i minus v plus 1. And i minus v uh, plus 1 is minus the number of loops. So I get 1 over f squared lambda squared to the negative of the power of loops. And then I get this factor here. So summarizing, you get g squared f squared to the lambda squared to the ig. And then over here, I get lambda squared. Um, and then because I want to put two loop uh, factors of 2L up here, the 1 over f squared lambda squared to the minus L just gives me 1 over f lambda 4 pi to the number of loops. So that's the final result for the power counting formula. And now what I want is I want to say that the C effective still respects this power counting. And let's forget about the first term for the moment and just look at what the second term is telling me. So this second term tells me that for the power counting to be consistent, the, this factor here should be of order 1. And that tells me that lambda is of order 4 pi f. That is, the f and lambda that we put in here is, are not independent of each other, but they're related by a factor of 4 pi. So this is the basic condition that we have. And in addition, if you put that in, the first factor here gives me a g squared over 16 pi squared to the number of one lines. So if you're looking at a strongly coupled theory, you can see that what strongly coupled means, where all of these terms are of the same size, is that gauge coupling constants should be of order 4 pi. So the g squared over 16 pi squared is 1. But if you're not doing that, if you have some weakly coupled theory, then we have a slightly more sophisticated version of this power counting argument, which tells you that every time you have an internal gauge field, you get an alpha of a 4 pi suppression to the number of internal gauge fields. But the part I want to concentrate on is this lambda is 4 pi f. It tells you that you should be using different factors for scalar fields, fermions, and covariant derivatives. And what are the consequences of that in chiral perturbation theory? So uh, let's just get rid of everything. So in chiral perturbation theory, the reason this parameter was called f to start with is because chiral perturbation theory has a natural parameter f pi, which is a quarter of 93 MeV. And we write everything in terms of a pion field e to the 2 pi i over f pi. And you can see that when you start expanding this thing out, you're automatically getting pions over the factors of f pi. You're getting pi over f pi to the powers just call it A. Pi is a scalar field, and our power counting formula said that every scalar field should come with a 1 over f. So in chiral perturbation theory, the thing we've been calling f is just the pion constant, which is why the notation was used. But what this is saying is that if I look at terms with more derivatives, every derivative in chiral perturbation theory, so if you look at the four derivative term, six derivative term, etc., every derivative comes with a factor of lambda, where lambda is 4 pi f. Now, why is that relevant? Well, if you're doing pi-pi scattering or something, this formula tells you that pi-pi to pi-pi is related to pi-pi to 4-pi and so on. And that's because chiral symmetry is a nonlinear symmetry and relates processes with different numbers of pions. But another thing you want to know is if I'm looking at pi-pi scattering and I want to look at the scattering amplitude as a function of momentum or as a function of energy, when does my expansion fail? And for that, I want to look at the derivative expansions. And what we're finding is that the expansion parameter is momentum over lambda. 
and lambda, which is 4 pi f, and 4 pi is not such a small number. It, it turns the thing which was about 100 MeV into something which is a 4 to 1 GeV for power of perturbation theory. So this tells you that the momentum expansion is valid up to a scale of about 1 GeV. And that makes sense because you know in QCD that around 1 GeV, the rho and all of the other meson resonances come in. But why this is important is suppose we hadn't known this, and we said that the scale is just f pi, which is 100 MeV. Well, in that case, you wouldn't be even be able to apply Carl perturbation theory to pi pi scattering because the pi on mass is about 135 to 239 MeV, depending on which pi on you take. And then the expansion, because the lowest energy an incoming pi on can have as its mass, would break down just because f pi is that small. But we are saved by this factor of 4 pi. It says we have a factor of 10 in energy for pions where you can do this calculation. The other place where this comes in is when people start looking for constraints on new physics. Imagine that the new physics came about in some form factor, so the analog of these sort of things. So there's some scattering amplitude for some fermion, and there's a form factor here. If you put a constraint on the variation of this form factor, we know that the form factor is some function p over lambda. And if you constrain that scale, you're constraining lambda. So you have some limit, and that's lambda. But if instead you constrain this by looking at some sort of four fermion operator, then a power counting formula says that this four fermion operator is really psi to the fourth over f squared. And so the constraint you're putting on the coefficient of the four fermion operator is a constraint on f. And that means that the scale lambda of the new physics is actually 10 times higher than the constraint you put on the, on the scale from putting constraints on four fermion operators from like deviations and you know, uh, quark quark scattering or other things at the LHC or previously at CDF. So hopefully this gives you some idea of how you can do this power counting and this relation lambda uh, and four pi f. Thanks.